All right, guys, I'm going to start with the, the whole practice test, and then I'll go back and I'll work through some of the un other individual problems that I asked you guys to add. So practice test number one. So state the domain and range of the relation shown in the table, then determine if it's a function, if it's one to one, both or neither. So the x's and y values are given. So this is one case, and people have asked before, like, you know, what's the difference between discrete and continuous? When is the domain not all reals? This is one case where the domain is not all reals because it's literally just listed as an individual list of points. So here, the individual x values are negative two is the first one, then four, and then three, and then six. The domain here literally is just a list of points. And then the range is the same way. We've got all of our y values listed. We have three, the next y value is negative one, the next y value is two, and then there's another y value of three. We don't list it twice, because we've already got it covered. And so just to see if it's a function, if it's one to one, on to, let's set up a little table that matches the x values to the y values. So here are all the values for the domain. Here are all the values for the range. And now let's do a little map, like the maps that we had in the notes. The first ordered pair is two, negative three. So that means two maps to three. I'm sorry, negative two, positive three. And then four, negative one. Then three, two. And then six, three. Okay, so is it a function? The definition of a function says that each x value goes to one and only one y value. This x value only goes to one y value, so does this one, so does this one, so does this one. So it is a function. We got that going for us. Then next, it says if it is a function, which it is, determine if it's one to one, on to, both, or neither. So one to one would mean that there is a perfect one to one matchup of x's and y's. That would mean that not only does each x go to only one y, but each y is matched with only one x. Where you can see here the 3, it's matched back to the negative 2, and it's matched back to the 6. So it is not 1 to 1. On 2 means that every element in the range gets hit at least once. Well, you can see here, the 3 gets hit, the negative 1 gets hit, the 2 gets hit. So it is on 2. And, oh, that's it. Um, on your test, you'll have to state whether it's discrete or continuous. This one will be discrete just because it's a finite list of numbers. It's not a continuous function like we've been seeing in the notes. Okay, for number two and number three, we're given this function f of x equals negative 2x plus 3. So for 2, we want to find f of negative 4. So when I have a negative 4 in the parentheses right here, I used to have an x, now I have a negative 4. It's kind of symbolic. That means I'm replacing the x with a negative 4 in my original equation. So negative 2, the x gets replaced with a negative 4, and then I add 3. So order of operations, I multiply first these two together. I get a positive 8 plus 3, which of course gives me 11. Okay, and then 3, I'm just doing another one of these. This time I want f of 3y. So exact same thing I just did up above. I'm going into this equation. Because I have an x here, I replace it with a 3y. And then I simplify up. So first I multiply these two together. Negative 2 times 3y is a negative 6y. And then I add 3. And so since those aren't like terms, I can't combine a y with a constant. That's just my final answer for number 3. For number four, I'm supposed to write 2y equals negative 6x plus 4 in standard form. So standard form is ax plus by equals c. We have two other conditions we need to meet. This number in front of the x has to be positive, can't be negative. And then these three numbers can't have anything in common, no GCF. So let's first add the 6x to both sides. So it can be over here where it's supposed to be. Cancels here. I have the 6x first plus 2y equals 4. So you can see everything's in the right order. ax plus by equals c. My constants are in the right order. I need to check, though, the two rules. This one can't be negative. It has to be positive, which it is, so we're good on that. But then these three numbers can't have something in common. They're all multiples of 2, and so we need to factor out the 2. So that means divide every single piece by 2. And let's rewrite it. So 6x divided by 2 is 3x plus 2y divided by 2 is y, and then equals 2 divided by, I'm sorry, 4 divided by 2 is 4. So that is my equation in standard form. And then, of course, this is to identify a, b, and c. So a is 3, b is just a 1, technically, in front of the y, and then c is 2. Be sure you're reading directions. If it tells you to identify them, make sure you identify them. 
5, find the x-intercept and y-intercept for 3x minus 4y equals negative 24. So the x-intercept and y-intercept I find by setting x equal to 0 and then setting y equal to 0. So to find my x-intercept, what I do to find my x-intercept is I set y equal to 0. Picture if you're on your horizontal x-axis, anywhere along that axis, the y value is going to be 0. So that's why I plug in y equals 0 to find my x-intercept, which is where I cross the x-axis. So 3x minus, and then I plug in a 0 for y, so there's nothing there. I guess I really don't even need the minus. Let's turn it into an equal sign. Negative 24, so to get my x-intercept, divide both sides by 3, so I get x equals negative 8. That's my x-intercept. For my y-intercept, I want you to think of the exact opposite logic. Where I cross the y-axis, that's my vertical axis, the x value is always 0. So exact opposite of what I just did. So if I plug in x is 0 over here, this term will be nothing. So I just have a negative 4y equals a negative 24. And then divide both sides by a negative 4. So I end up with y equals a positive 6. So here's my x-intercept, here's my y-intercept. This particular problem did not ask you to graph, but you could definitely be asked to graph using your x and y-intercept. So make sure you're reading directions. 6 is a multiple choice. So the cost of producing x pumpkin pies is given by c of x equals 49 plus 1.75x. Okay, find the cost of producing 25 pies. So this is actually something that's very, very similar. It's like number two or number three. It gives us a function, and then it gives us a value of x to plug in. So it wants us to find the cost of 25 pies. That means we're replacing the x with the 25. Okay, so that, I'm sure some of us could probably do it in our heads. We are just going to plug that right into the calculator. So we've got 49 plus 1.75 times 25 pies. And so we end up with 92.75. So that is a dollar amount, so you should write it as a dollar amount. There we go. Oh, and on the multiple choice, that would be letter C. Sorry. Number seven, find the slope of the line that passes through each pair of points. So I'm going to write us a formula here. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That gives us the slope. We use m for slope. So for number 7 and for number 8, I'm just going to plug these values in. So I have the point 1, 6, and I also have the point 3, 10. So we'll let this point be my x1, y1. We'll let this point be my x2, y2. Okay, so I'm just going to plug those values in. So y2 is 10 minus y1, which is 6, over x2 is 3, and then minus x1, which is 1. So simplify these up. So 10 minus 6, of course, is 4, two, or 3 minus 1 is 2, and 4 over 2 reduces down to a slope of 2 for number 7. Number 8, I've got two more ordered pairs. Here they are. This one we're going to throw in some negatives, make them a little trickier. This one will be our x1, y1. This one will be our x2, y2. And we are just going to plug these four values into this formula right here. So y2 is negative 1 minus y1, which is 7, over x2 is 3 minus x1, which is negative 2. Be very, very careful with the minus and negative. Make sure you change it into plus a positive. So a negative 1 minus 7 ends up being a negative 8 because they're both negative. And then 3 plus 2 is 5. You can leave it like that. Uh, if you want decimals, if you want fractions, feel free to reduce it down. A fraction would be negative 1 and 3 fifths. But I am totally, totally fine with improper fractions. Another multiple choice. So here we are finding the equation of the line that passes through this particular point. So this is a type of question that I would definitely expect. So this is a good one to know how to do. So for these, we want the slope, but I'm going to write down this point slope form that you need to use for problems like this. So you've got the slope, which we need to find, and we will find, just like we did with 7 and 8, using these two points, and then you plug in a sample point, the x1 and the y1. So the slope, let's again do x1, y1, x2, y2. So y2 is 1 minus y1, which is negative 3. So this is the slope. And then x2 is 4 minus x1, which is 0. So change this to plus a positive. So I get 4 in the numerator. I get 4 in the denominator. So my slope is 1. And then I want to plug all these things in into my equation that I've got written right here. So y minus 
Now y1, we could use negative 3, or we could use 1. We just want to pick one of these points to use. So y minus the y value is negative 3, and then equals my slope is 1, and then in parentheses I'm going to put x minus the x value, which the x one that I have here is 0. So again, I chose to use the 0 and the negative 3. You could have definitely chosen to use the 4 and the 1. Either way, you just can't mix and match. You can't like pull this x value but pull this y value. So simplify things up. So this goes to plus a positive. If I simplify up the right-hand side, distribute the 1. 1 times x is just x. And then 1 times 0 is 0, so I don't need to write that. And I have a y plus 3 on the other side. Subtract 3 from both sides. So my equation is y equals x minus 3. All right, and for the multiple choice, that would go with letter H. Okay, so let's keep looking. We've got number 10. Okay, number 10, write an equation in slope-intercept form for the line that has a slope of negative 2 and passes through the point 3, negative 4. So I will again write down this point slope form just so we've got it on the same screen with us. So this is my slope, this is going in for m, and then this is my x1, y1, a sample point that I can plug in. All right, so y minus, now the y value is negative 4, equals the slope, which is negative 2, and then in parentheses, x minus the x value of 3. Okay, so a couple things. This one, change to plus a positive. On the right-hand side, I want to distribute the negative 2 to both of these terms. So I have negative 2 times x, and then negative 2 times negative 3 is a positive 6. Over here on the left, I still have my y plus 4. So we get y by itself, so I can actually be in sloped-intercept form. I am going to subtract 4 from both sides. So I get y by itself, which is just what I wanted, equals negative 2x, and then plus 2 when I do the subtraction. So that is my line for number 10. For number 11, I'm looking for another line. Uh, this passes through the points 2, negative 4, and 1, 6. So I'm going to do pretty much the same thing I did for number 9. I'm going to first find the slope in between them, and then I'm going to plug in one of the points. So this is x1, this is y1, this is x2, this is y2. So for the slope, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So this changes to plus a positive. 6 plus 4 is 10 over 1 minus 2 is a negative 1. So when I take 10 and I divide it by a negative 1, I get negative 10 for my slope. And I'm going to plug it into this point slope form that I've got right here. So y minus the y value. So now just to show you that we could use another point, I'll plug this point in instead. So the y value is 6 equals the slope, which I just found was negative 10, and then in parentheses x minus the x value, which is 1. Okay, so just like I did up above, first distribute the negative 10. So negative 10 times x, and then negative 10 times negative 1 is a positive 10. Last thing here, I want to get y by itself, so I'm in slope-intercept form, is I'm going to add the 6 to both sides. All right, so I get the y by itself, and I get a negative 10x, and then this will be plus 16. Okay, it looks like one more of these for number 12, another equation. I write in slope-intercept form the line that passes through the point negative 3, 5. So again, that is my sample point. That is my x1, y1. Then it's parallel to y equals negative 6x plus 1. So the line that I'm parallel to has a slope of negative 6, which means that my graph should also have a slope of negative 6. Anything that's parallel has the exact same slope, so that's the slope I want to use. Anything that's perpendicular has the opposite reciprocal slope. So just for fun, if we were doing a perpendicular line, which we're not, its slope would be a positive 1 over 6. But this one's parallel. So we do the y minus y1. It's out of the shot now, so I'm going to write it again. Okay, so y minus the y value, which is 5. I get that right here equals the slope, and I use the slope of negative 6 because it's supposed to be parallel to this line. Remember, this negative 1 has nothing to do with our problem at all. And then in parentheses, I do x minus the x value, which right here is a negative 3. So in my simplifying, I change this to plus a positive. I distribute the negative 6. I get negative 6x minus 18. Last thing left to do, 
to get my y by itself is to add the 5 to both sides. So y is now by itself, and I get a negative 6x minus 13. Okay, number 13. Looks like we get our scatter plot practice here. So number 13, you know, I'm going to start a fresh page here, so I've got the room. Number 13, hopefully you've got your data right in front of you, because I don't want to copy this page down. Uh, make a scatter plot. Uh, you know what? So I can reference it. We've got October through February. And then here are our values. Okay, so those values, those are the ones we're going to plot. And then we're going to come up with a prediction equation and then use the prediction equation. So our scatter plot for part A, if we set up like, you know, months or something like that, and then visits. Okay, so we could do October, November, December, January, February. Okay, and then our visits. So let's, I don't know if you guys have seen me do this before. You can add a little squiggle onto the y-axis if you want to start somewhere new. That way you don't have to start at zero and go all the way up. So we can start at 120. And then go 130, 140, 150, 160, 170, 180, whoops, 190, 200, sorry. All right, in October, we've got 124, so right about there. November, there are 163, so here's 130, 140, 150, 160, so about 163. December was 155. January is 171, and February was 192, so sorry, this is kind of annoyingly right through the data here. So for this one, I'm trying to think of what would be a good fit. So for part B, you can really pick any two points you want. Um, you could just pick the first and the last, and that's always a safe bet to go with. So we could go right through the first to the last. Okay, so now this would actually stop here. Eh, no, it would keep going, I guess, because there are past months. So if we keep it going, it's going to go through this first point and it's going to go through this last point. So when we are doing this prediction equation, it's actually exactly like something like number 11 or something like number 9, where you've got the two points and we're basically just asking you to find the equation of the line that runs through those two points. We just have to pick them off the table, off the graph first. Then you find the slope, and then you plug it into this point slope form. So that's exactly what we're doing for these. So this first point right here, now here's the thing. We need to assign a number, because obviously I can't do February minus October. I don't know what that would give me. Um, so let's say that this is month one, two, three, four. Five. I wouldn't give you something like this without being pretty explicit about what to use for the numbers and for the x-axis and stuff like that. So this point right here, I use 1 for October, comma, 124. And then this last point, I'm using 5 for September. And then the value is 192. All right, so hopefully that's more helpful to look at it with numbers because you can't do October, comma, 124. That doesn't make any sense. So for part B, using those two points, first I find the slope. So I've got my x1, y1, x2, x, or y2. So I do y2 minus y1, and then over x2 minus x1. Now, this may not be the prediction equation that you came up with. You may have picked two different points, and if you did, that's fine. Maybe you picked the point from October and you picked the point from January. If you picked the point from November, your slope is going to look a lot different, because notice that's kind of an outlier. But anyways, if you want, you can just plug this right into the calculator. Do a little fraction. Do 192 minus 124. Put that over 5 minus 1. And so we get is 17. So slope of 17, what that means is with each passing month, you're getting about 17 extra emergency room visits. That's what the slope means. So let me write down this generic equation one more time. 
I'm going to plug in my values. So y minus, now here you can pick this one if you want, you can pick this one if you want. You might be looking at this one and thinking like, oh, one, that's a nice, neat number. So you know what, let's do that. But if you love the number 192, then that's your point. Okay, so we plug in the y value for this one, which is 124, equals, here the slope is 17, we just found it right there, and then x minus the x value, which over here is 1. So just like I did with 11, I'm going to start simplifying down. On the right-hand side, I distribute my 17. On the left-hand side, I still have 124, so I'm going to have to add that to both sides. So I have y by itself here, and then I have a 17x. Now here I've got a negative 17 and a positive 124, so just be careful with some of your addition there. You end up with a positive 107. So that's your equation. That would be your final answer for part B. You're going to have to do something just like this on the test as well. And then for part C, it says use your prediction equation to predict the number of emergency room visits for March. So March, if we are going with this pattern that we've got right here, February is 5, the next month is March, so that would be 6. March would be month 6 if we're going off this pattern. So what I'm looking at right here, I would plug in the x as 6. So y equals 17, plug in 6, and then plus 107. And this you can just plug right into your calculator. So 17 times 6, and then plus 107. Okay, so this predicts 209. So 209 emergency room visits, which doesn't seem so far off, kind of based off of the table values that you have so far. Okay, next is number 14. Ah, graphing the piecewise function. Here we go. So f of x equals, we've got negative x if x is less than negative 2. I'm going to write it down. I'm going to put on some graph paper. Okay, so there's our graph. So like I said, I'm going to put up some graph paper. So here we go. Okay, so here's our x-axis. Here's our y-axis. So starting with this first piece right here, negative x if x is less than negative 2. So we're talking about the x values. On the right-hand side here, they're always talking about the x values, and this is your x-axis. So it's saying for the x values that are less than negative 2, so here's my x value of negative 2, I'm talking anything to the left. Any x value in this range right here, I'm going to plot this function. So here's what I do. You start plugging things in. You're like, okay, so if I want to plug anything to the left of negative 2, I'm going to plug it into this equation right here. And remember what this really is, is just the equation y equals negative x. So if I wanted to plug in some things, I could basically set up a little table here. So you want to start with the negative 2, because that's the first number that they mention, is negative 2. And if I plug it in here, negative negative 2 is a positive 2. And then I could plug in some other numbers that are less than negative 2 such as negative 3, negative 4, but I can't plug anything greater because that doesn't fit into this restriction right here. So if I plug in negative 3, I get positive 3. If I plug in negative 4, I get positive 4. So I can start plotting those points. So I have a point negative 2, 2. I have a point negative 3, 3. Negative 4, 4. And it's just going to keep going with that pattern. And hopefully we notice here, there's a negative 1 in front of the x. So that means I've got a slope of negative 1. So I can follow a slope of negative 1, but then I have to stop when I get to that point, when I get to x equals negative 2. And what I put is an open circle. I have just a less than, which means that on this point in particular, I put an open circle, not a closed circle. And then it would keep going off to the left here. Okay, so that's my first piece. This is the line negative x. It's got a slope of negative 1. If you look from corner to corner, You've got a run, I'm sorry, a rise of negative 1, a run of positive 1, down 1 to the right 1, down 1 to the right 1. If it kept going, you would cross the x-axis, I'm sorry, cross the y-axis at the origin, which is why this one has a y-intercept of 0. So that's my first piece. Second piece, I want to plot this line from negative 2 to positive 2, so I can set up another little table. So I can plug in anything into this equation, y equals x plus 2. 
Now, I can plug in anything I want between negative 2 and positive 2. Make sure you're actually plugging in the negative 2 and the positive 2. So when I plug in negative 2 into this equation, I have negative 2 plus 2, which gives me 0. And if I plug in 2 into that equation, I get 2 plus 2, which is 4. So I want to at least plot those points. So at negative 2, I want to plot a point at 0. At positive 2, I want to plot a point at 4, which is right here. Okay, so basically, I'm just going to connect those dots. Looks like that. So now two things to point out. If you look at my original equation, it's x plus 2. That means the slope is 1, because I technically have a 1 in front of the x. And you can see here on my graph, I go up one to the right one, up one to the right one, up one to the right one, until my graph stops. This plus 2 means I have a y-intercept of 2, which right here, that is exactly where I cross the y-axis. Because of my or equal to's, both of these are going to be closed circles. Closed circle, closed circle. Okay, so that's the second part of my graph. Last part, just a 5. That's the line y equals 5. If y equals 5, then y is always 5. So I start here, and then I just draw a horizontal line. Going off to the right, I finish it off with an open circle, because this is just greater than 2, not greater than or equal to 2. And again, these numbers, the negative 2 and the positive 2, those are x-coordinates. Here, these two points have an x-coordinate of negative 2. This graph stops here, this graph starts here, and these two points have an x-coordinate of positive 2. This graph stops here, this graph starts here. That would be your final answer for number 14. For number 15, I'm going to have to try to sneak the book on here. See if we can do both. I'll try my best for you. All right, so looking at, and we might even have to alternate back and forth. Looking at this graph, this piecewise defined function, we are looking for two things out of each of those diagonal lines. We need the slope and we need the y-intercept. So let's write the first graph, the second graph, the third graph. So in my first graph, I want to try to count the slope. So this one right here, it goes through a corner there, and it goes through a corner there. You can actually count out. I go down two over to the right one. And when I go down two over to the right one, that is a slope of negative two. So let's write m equals negative two for the first one. Okay? And my y-intercept, if I were to keep going, from this open circle, I could go down two to the right one, and I would land right at the origin. So that means that my y-intercept is zero. Okay? So that's my first equation. My second equation, this is a horizontal line. There is no slope, so I've got nothing to write down there, but the y value is a constant negative 1. Okay, so that's what I write for b, negative 1. Then my third equation, this one doesn't give me much to go off of. From the open circle to the corner of that arrow, I can go through those two corners. I go up 1 to the right 1. That means I've got a slope of 1. And then if I carried that slope of 1 back, let's see where we'd hit the x, I'm sorry, the y-axis. So I can go down to the left, down to the left, down to the left, and I would land right there at y equals 1. Okay, so let's write down these three equations. So this is f of x equals, so I take these three equations, I'm going to put them in here. So this first one, I'm going off of y equals mx plus b, by the way. This one, m is negative 2 x, and then I don't need to write a plus 0. You can if you want. You know, it's like, what the heck, I'll throw it on there. This next one, b is negative 1, so that is just a constant negative 1. There's no mx in this equation. Next, m is 1, so I have a 1x, and then b is 1, so 1x plus 1. Again, I do not need to write the 1 right here. I can just write x, and I definitely don't have to write the 0 right here. Some people just like seeing all the parts of mx plus b. Okay, so that's to start with. So now I have if... This is always a less than, might be a less than or equal to. This is always a three piece. Again, I might have the or equal to's. And this one is always a greater than, might be an or equal to. So I just need to figure out the numbers. So for my first piece, this one, this open circle tells me that it's still just a less than, not a less than or equal to. And if I trace down, this x coordinate is a negative one. So that open ordered pair right there has an x value of negative one. So I put a negative 1 for the ending point of my first graph. Then from here to here, this one picks up at negative 1, and it goes until x equals 3. So this ordered pair has an x value of negative 1. This one has an x value of positive 3. So I go from negative 1 to positive 3. They both have closed circles, 
So they both have an or equal to. And then the last one, this one picks up right here. This x coordinate is also positive 3. And it's just a greater than because it's an open circle. So this right here is my beautiful piecewise function equation. All right, let me get the book out of here. Okay, 16. Here's a step function. So we want to identify the domain and range of y equals the greatest integer of x plus 2. Okay, so let's take a look at the calculator. So I told you guys you'd be doing these on your calculator. So you're going to want a graph page. So you can either add a new page by pressing or control and then doc, and you can make it a graph page, or you can open up a brand new document and make that a graph page. So for your greatest integer function, you literally type in INT into your calculator. It's an abbreviation for integer. And then because this X is inside the greatest integer function, I put the letter X in parentheses like that. And then I have a plus 2 on the outside, so plus 2. Hit enter. That is my graph. Many of us probably looked at this exact graph in class today because this is one of the examples that I gave. So domain and range. All you'll have to do when you see this on the homework, or when it, sorry, when you see this on the test, is just identify the domain and range. So the domain is all reals. I can plug in any x value that I want. There's no restriction to what I can plug into this function right here, this function right here, anything. So my domain is just all reals. Or you could write out all reals. Whatever you prefer. All right, so then back to this picture. This picture, I have a y value here, then it jumps up to the next one, then it jumps up to the next one. So my y values are just all of the whole numbers, positive and negative. So I only hit at 0, then I jump up to 1, then I jump up to 2, and then 3. There's no decimals, no fractions in between, so it's not all reals, because I don't hit all the decimals, all the fractions. I only hit the integer values. So my range, the only y values that I actually hit are all of the integers. Okay, so that would be my final answer for number 16. Like I said, all you need is domain and range. Number 17, we're looking for the translation for y equals x squared plus 5. So now remember in your test, I'm not going to say translation, reflection, or dilation. I'm just going to say describe the transformation. You're going to have to identify if it's a translation, a reflection, or a dilation. So this one is a translation. So this is what I want to see on your test when it asks you to describe. So it is a translation of, and then write down the parent function. So your parent function is either y equals x, y equals x squared, or y equals the absolute value of x. They're usually pretty obvious. I mean, this one has an x squared. It doesn't have an absolute value or anything like that. So it's a translation of y equals x squared. And then this plus 5 on the outside, if a number's on the outside like this, this means it either is up or down. And the plus 5 means it goes up. So this is a translation, 5 units up. So the book didn't ask you to graph it, but you will be expected to graph it on the quiz, the test. So let me just show you. So up 5 units. And then from here, that's your new starting point instead of at the origin. From there, you just draw the parent function, just a parabola like that. Okay, y equals the negative absolute value of x. So this, again, is a reflection, although on your test, I will not tell you translation or reflection or dilation. You're going to have to come up with that word. This is a reflection of y equals the absolute value of x. That's the parent function. Because the negative is on the outside, I flip over the x-axis. If the negative was inside, I'd flip over the y-axis. So this is over the x-axis. And again, you're just asked to describe, but I'm going to show you a little graph because you'll be expected to graph on the test. So when the absolute value gets flipped over the x-axis, it gets flipped over and it looks like this. This is like the opposite version of your absolute value graph, the upside down version, if you will. Okay, so two more on the practice test. Let's do 19 first, one of the inequalities, and then we've got some extra problems to jump to really quickly. So y is greater than or equal to 4x minus 1. So this one is actually already in slope-intercept form. So we can graph this using the y-intercept and using the slope. Just a little practice for the piecewise functions. So when I set this up, my boundary line is y equals 4x minus 1. And it's going to be a solid line. 
and that is because I have the greater than or equal to. The or equal to makes it solid. So if I look, this is mx plus b, so the plus b is a negative one. So I go down here, there's my y-intercepts. <coughs> and then I have a slope of four. So for my next point, for instance, I go up one, two, three, four, and then over to the right one, so I can plot my next point right there. And that's really all I need. I only need two points to draw a line. And it is a solid line, so I'm just going to connect those dots, make a line, arrow on both sides. It comes pretty close, but my line does not go through zero, zero, so I can test it out. So test zero, zero. So is zero greater than or equal to four times zero minus one? Question mark. So left hand side is just zero. The right hand side, when I simplify it up, ends up being a negative one. And zero is, in fact, greater than or equal to negative one. And so I shade the region that contains the zero, zero. So let's get this right here. There we go. So I shade this region kind of up above and to the left. All right. Next one and last one on the practice test is number 20, another one of these inequalities. This one I graph using the x and y intercepts like we did in class because this one's in standard form, or close to standard form. It has a GCF that you'd have to factor out normally. So my boundary line is 2x plus 6y equals negative 12. That is going to be a dotted boundary line. So I set up my x-intercept and my y-intercept. For my x-intercept, I plug in 0 for y and then solve for x. So I solve 2x equals negative 12. Divide both sides by 2. So I get x equals negative 6. That's my x-intercept. For my y-intercept, I plug in 0 for x and then solve for y. So I solve 6y equals negative 12. So that gives me a y-intercept of negative 2. So on my graph over here, I have an x-intercept of negative 6. So that is where I cross the x-axis. I have a y-intercept of negative 2, so I cross right here. This is a dotted boundary line, so I'm going to connect those dots using a dotted line like that. 0, 0 is nowhere near that graph, so I can use it as a test point. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and plug that in. So is 2 times 0 plus 6 times 0 less than a negative 12 question mark. So this comes out to be 0. Is 0 less than negative 12? No, it's not. Negative 12 would be less than. This is false. So if I come up with a false statement like this, I shade the opposite region, the one that does not contain 0, 0. So that would be the stuff kind of underneath and to the left, like that. All right, so those are the values that, or those are the questions that I gave you guys on the practice test. Flip back, the next thing we did was page 123, some of those linear examples. So we are now on page 123. We've got just a few more examples to go. Number 19 is the first equation, and this is x squared plus y squared equals 4. And so it asks if it's a linear function. Well, number 19, no, number 19 is not a linear function. And the reason being is because there are exponents other than 1. Exponents that are not exponents of 1, because x to the first is fine. y to the first is fine. We don't have a right that it's to the first, but they always are. Number 21, we have y equals 6x minus 19. This one, as it turns out, is totally fine. There are no exponents. There's no division of variables. The variables aren't being multiplied together. I have y totally by itself, y to the first, technically. The x is only being multiplied by a number, and then I subtract a number, so this is totally fine. And 23, I have 1 over x plus 3y equals negative 5. This one is not okay either. Hopefully you guys recognize that x in the denominator is a problem. So our issue is there is an x in the denominator. And that is a problem for us. All right, the last thing, or the last few problems that we have are on page 126. We had those absolute value equations and then, I'm sorry, inequalities. And then those are, those are the last little pieces. So page 126, there we go. So two absolute value inequalities and then we're done. So number 59 
59, we have y is greater than or equal to the absolute value of 2x minus 2. All right, so our boundary is y equals the absolute value of 2x minus 2, and it is going to be a solid line. Thank goodness, then we don't have to make that dotted mistake. It's going to be a solid line because I have the greater than or equal to. So for the absolute value inequalities, this is the only way that we know how to draw the absolute value line, is by plugging things into a table. So those same seven values that we've been using in the notes and that you've hopefully been using in the homework, you just plug those right in. So I've got two options. I can either plug it in kind of by hand, can plug in the negative 3, plug that in like that. So 2 times negative 3 is negative 6, minus 2 is negative 8, and the absolute value of negative 8 is positive 8. I can do the same thing with my negative 2. So this is one option for me. Kind of do it all by hand. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. Minus 2 is negative 6. The absolute value of negative 6 is positive 6. Or we talked in class about how we could plug right into our calculator. So from a calculator page, and this would probably be a good thing to kind of follow along with me, even though you are watching the video, because this would be good practice for the test. So this absolute value expression. Absolute value I get by pressing this weird little key just to the right of the 9. So press that key, and then the option that's highlighted currently is the absolute value option. It's the second row, first box. It's the absolute value of 2, and then times, now see how here in the parentheses I plugged in my x value? Next I'm going to plug in a negative 1, parentheses, minus 2. So it looks exactly like what I just wrote down here, but I can just take turns plugging in different values. So when I plug in the negative 1, I get 4. Then you can always just copy-paste. I can just arrow up, up again. When it's highlighted in blue, if I hit enter, then it pastes it, and I can go back and change the negative 1 to a 0. When I do that, I get 2. Now, you probably think that you see a pattern, like, oh, it's just going down by 2 every time. Be very careful in thinking that you recognize the pattern, because it can turn back around at any time. My next x value is 1, so I'm going to replace that 0 with a 1, and I get 0. Then I'm going to plug in 2, so copy-paste again. Replace that x value with a 2, and I get 2. And then finally, copy-paste one more time, and replace that x value with a 3, and I get 4. So you can see a pattern once it's in front of you, but you need to be careful about thinking that you spotted it too early. Because most of the time, people think when you get to 0, you turn back around. You actually don't in this case. People also, a lot of times, think that plugging in negative 3 and positive 3 will give you the same y value. Again, here it doesn't. So let's set up those values. So here's my x-axis. Okay, and then I need to go up to 8. There we go. Okay, so negative 3, 8. Negative 2, 6. Negative 1, 4, 0, 2, 1, 0, 2, 2, and 2, 4. So we've got our seven values there. It is a solid line, so I'm just going to connect the dots. And then connect the dots going the other way. You can continue to extend it, of course, because you know what the pattern is going to be. And then we test our point. 0, 0 is available because it's not right on the line. So test the 0, 0. So is 0 greater than or equal to the absolute value of 2 times 0 minus 2? Question mark. So let's simplify this up. So 2 times 0 is 0. Minus 2 is negative 2. The absolute value is 2. So is 0 greater than or equal to 2? No. This is false. So what I do is I don't shade the region that has 0, 0. I shade the opposite region, which for my absolute value, it's either inside of this shape or outside of this shape. So here I shade everything inside the shape. So something like that. Okay, my very, very last one for this video is number 60. So I have y plus 3 is less than the absolute value of x plus 1. So for this one, to get the y by itself, I subtract 3 from both sides. Now very, very careful here. I saw some mistakes in the homework. When you subtract the 3, it does not, absolutely does not get absorbed into the absolute value. You can't just break into the absolute value just because you want to. The negative 3 ends up outside of the parent function. So this is going to be your inequality. 
For my boundary line, I just replaced the inequality with an equal sign. And I know that this one's going to be a whoops, dotted line because it does not have the or equal to. It's just less than. Let's see if I remember to make it dotted. Here's hoping. So here is our equation. We'll use the calculator again. So plug in those same seven values. So just like up above, you've got options. I can plug in the negative 3 right here, kind of do it out by hand. Negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2. The absolute value of negative 2 is positive 2. Minus 3 gives me negative 1. Or I can plug it into the calculator. So the absolute value button, again, right here next to the 9. So hit that key. Gives you your absolute value menu. I'm going to plug in the x, which here is negative 2. It's my next x value. Plus 1. And then outside I have minus 3. So hit enter and I get a negative 2. And then when I plug in the negative 1, so again I'm just copy pasting this first number. I now want to replace the negative 1. So here I get negative 3. Copy paste again. I'm going to plug in the 0. I get negative 2. Copy paste again plug in the 1, I get negative 1. Two more times. Now I'm going to plug in the 2 and I get 0. And then last but not least, plug in the 3 and I get 1. So those are my seven values. Those are the values that I'm going to plot. And I will say again that this should be a dotted boundary line. Let's see if I can remember it. So x is 1, 2, 3. y is 1, 2, 3. Okay, and then I actually need to extend a little bit lower into the negatives here. I have a negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. So my first point is at negative 3, negative 1. My next point is at negative 2, negative 2. Then I have negative 1, negative 3. Then 0, negative 2, so it turned back around down there. 1, negative 1. 2, 0, and 3, 1. So like I said before, you know you can extend a little bit farther than this. We've got a dotted boundary line here. That's its low point, and then it turns back around, and we can always extend beyond those points. Just looks cleaner to me if it's even like that. Okay, then the test point I use is 0, 0. It is, again, nowhere near my dotted line. So test the point 0, 0. So I'm looking at my original equation. You always want to plug it into the original. So 0 for y plus 3. Is that less than the absolute value of 0 plus 1? So left-hand side comes out to be 3. Is 3 less than 1? Question mark. No. That, of course, is false. And so because that's false, I shade the region that does not contain the origin. So that ends up being everything underneath. So it will look like that when you're done. All right, so again, feel free to email me with questions or come in to get help in the morning.